Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Wise people are builders. They build families, businesses, communities, and through intelligence and insight, their enterprises are established and endure. Because of their skilled leadership, the hearts of people are filled with the treasures of wisdom and the pleasures of spiritual wealth. Proverbs 23, 3, or 24, 3 through 4. I want to look at it and get it right. I, I know that verse is important, and I know that the Lord gave that to Jennifer when we first started, as that being the verse that we are standing on that for our area. Not just Wilberton, but Hartshorn, McAllister, Stigler, Quentin, Curtin. It doesn't matter. All the area that we interact with people in and we have people we love and interact with, we're, we're saying this blessing for them as well. So my sister calls me nearly every morning and we pray together on the phone as she's going to work. And one day this morning, I think maybe it was Wednesday morning, she had read um, Colossians 1 and 2. She read it to me over the phone. And it struck both of us. It struck a chord with both, both of us. And I'm just going to read the verse 2, which says, May God, our true Father, release upon your lives the riches of his kind favor and heavenly peace through the Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Isn't that good? Don't we all desire God's favor? If we have God's favor, what can man do to us? God is God. And heavenly peace, not peace um, that the world gives. And we're going to read that verse in a little bit. But heavenly peace. And that made me think of the Christmas story. And so we know that Jesus was born in a very tumultuous time. Even more tumultuous than the times we're living in now. Because the Romans had, had taken over um, Israel. They were in rule. They were... Um, a very military country in that they enforced what they wanted things to be. And so the Jewish people were under a lot of oppression. So it was born not in a peaceful time, but an unpeaceful time, a tumultuous time. But he came. God came in flesh. And in Luke 2, you all know this very well, but I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. Luke 2, 13 and 14 says, Then all at once... A vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven. And they all praised God, singing, Glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is a peace and a good hope given to the sons of men. So Jesus came to be peace. In fact, one of his names is Prince of Peace. God is Jehovah Shalom. That means the God of peace. So peace is who God is. And we need peace. I made that one of my focal points of my life about 20, 25 years ago because my life was not peaceful at all. In fact, I grew up thinking that if you were very, very busy and you were very, very stressed out and you were always worrying about something, that made you a very conscientious person. Now, doesn't that sound really crazy? But that's what I thought. I was listening to the lies of the devil and I just got to where I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't live under so much anxiety all the time. And so I've told you this before. I, I asked the Lord, I said, I just can't do this anymore. I, I mean, I was, Earl called me the church lady. I was teaching Sunday school and I was head of VBS and I led a women's prayer group and I, you know, was teaching school full time and being a mom and being a wife and I had all these duties. And I said, God, I'm ready to chunk all of this. I'm done with all of it because it doesn't feel very real. If this is what being a Christian is about, I'm done. And so peace became my focal point. The, the word says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And at that point in my life, all I wanted was peace. I did not care about anything else. I lived in a very nice house, had very nice vehicles, got to take nice vacations, wore nice clothes. We looked like the perfect family. And I was willing to give it all up for peace. I just wanted peace. And God came. If you call to him, he'll come. If you, the Bible says if you seek the Lord with your whole heart, you will find him. Well, see, I'd been seeking the Lord my whole life, but it was kind of half-hearted. I was much more interested in what was going on in the world than I, what I was, was with my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
In fact, I always say that it was like I dated Jesus for 20 years, and then we got married, and everything changed. We became intimate, and he became my, the source of my life. And I started getting peace, and I became a peace junkie. I couldn't stand when I wasn't in peace. And I still, to this day, when I start you know, getting stressed or things start getting too busy, I just pull back and I'm like, mm-mm. Not going down that rabbit hole. Don't want to go there anymore. It is a slippery slide, and I know where it leads. So God is the God of peace, and the peace has already been given, it says, to the sons of men. God's already given his peace. So why isn't there peace? Why isn't there peace? If, if peace has already been given to us, why don't we have peace? So let's look. That was the beginning of Jesus' life. The angels announced, the one who brings peace and hope is here. In John 14, 27, out of the Passion Translation, Jesus says this to his disciples. This is before he's crucified and resurrected. He says, I leave the gift of peace with you, my peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. So Jesus is saying, you know, the world says peace may mean that there's no war. There's no conflict. There's tranquility. You feel like you're sitting at the beach with one of those little drinks with an umbrella in it in your hand and your toes in the, in the water and, you know what, in the sand. That's what the world says peace is. And don't get me wrong, that's a great life. That's great there's, if there's no war and you get to have a beach vacation and you feel at peace. But that's all affected by external things. Real peace comes even when there's conflict, even when there's war, even when there's tumult. You're, you're the perfect peace is the peace that's on the inside. And it can work its way out. If it permeates you, it starts working its way out around you. Do you... Feel that when you're here? Do you feel God's peace when you're in the sanctuary? You know, churches, this part of a building of a church is called a sanctuary. That just implies there's peace here. That implies that there's supposed to be peace. There's a sanctuary from all the tumult, all the war, all the chaos. Because Satan is the author of confusion or chaos. So if you have chaos and confusion in your life, you can bet his fingerprints are on it. So sometimes that's a good way for us to understand how to weed those things out of our lives that we don't need. If it's creating chaos and confusion, maybe you need to ask God about it. That's not him. He's the author of peace. He is peace. So Jesus says, don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous because the Prince of Peace lives inside of you. When Jesus was crucified and he was resurrected remember his disciples were very fearful and they left the scene of the crucifixion only John stayed because they were in so much fear afraid for their own lives so at the beginning of Jesus's life he talks about peace or it's, the angels talk about peace all through his life he talks about peace peace is all through the New Testament at the end of his time here on earth before he ascends to the Father in John 20, 19, out of the Passion Translation, translation, it says, That evening, meaning right after Jesus was resurrected, the disciples gathered together. And because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, they had locked the doors to the place where they met. But suddenly, Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace to you. The very first words that he spoke to his disciples was peace. So how important was it? How important was it that someone dies and they're resurrected and instead of going, hey, look, guys, I'm alive. He says, peace to you. The very first thing he says, peace. Don't be afraid anymore. Don't worry. Don't fret or stress or have anxiety because peace is here in this room with you right now. I am peace and I'm here and you can be at peace. So if we're thinking about peace... We know it's a lot of times what's in our mind. 
And what we think about and what we focus on becomes what we project out, right? It becomes the image that we start living with, who, what kind of person we are, what we think about ourselves, what we think about others. Those are the kinds of things we start believing, and they become truths to us. In Isaiah 26, 3, this may be one of your favorite verses, too. It is mine. In the New King James, Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Or some translations say fixed. Because he trusts in you. Because you can't get peace unless you fix your mind on peace. Have you ever gone to bed with your mind just whirling with a million things that you can't, you can't stop it? It's like a gerbil in a cage. And you can't stop thinking about all the things you have to do or you need to do or what's happening or how am I going to pay this or what will that person do? Or, and, it, and you can't even sleep. And he says, I will keep you in perfect peace if you'll fix your mind on me. And that means an action on your part. It means an action on my part. He doesn't do that part for us. It's not like we just lay down in bed and God just drops peace on us. He could. But just like God does everything, he lets us choose. He's a God of choices. He's a God who loves us enough to let us make the wrong choice. But he's always calling us, make the right choice. Choose to fix your mind on me. Fix your mind on me and how powerful I am. I'm God. What problem do you have that I can't fix? What's going on in your life with your time, your money, your relationships, your, your resources? What do you have that I can't give you what you need? What do you need that you can't ask me for? So we have to fix our mind on those things. God, I trust in you. Sometimes I'll just over and over say to myself, God, I just trust in you. I just trust in you. Even when I want to start getting anxious, I'm like, God, I trust in you. And it brings his peace. It takes practice. But you, if you've practiced chaos and anxiety for a long time, you may be good at it. We have to learn to practice peace. And it always starts here. It always starts here. So I found some other verses that I thought very well related to that. So 2 Timothy 1.7, we're very familiar with this verse, and I'm going to read it out of the Passion as well. For God will never give you the spirit of fear or anxiety or depression or chaos or confusion. All those things that might fit under that category of fear, God will never give you that and it says it's a spirit. Notice it's a lowercase s. That means there are spirits of fear that exist, or the Bible couldn't say that God did, wouldn't give us that. God can't give us the spirit of fear. But he gives us the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. Doesn't that sound like peace? Okay, so God doesn't give us these spirits that create these negative emotions. And I'm not saying you don't, won't experience fear. You won't experience anxiety. It's the learning to take control of it before it takes control of you. Because circumstances in your humanity, you're going to feel those things sometimes. You're going to feel shame. You're going to feel anger. You're going to feel anxiety. It's when you decide to choose to fix your mind on Jesus, put your trust in him, that then the peace can come in spite of the circumstance. So what is the best way to get that? So I look back in the Old Testament, and there are lots and lots of verses. In Deuteronomy 10, 12, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel, the second generation that's getting ready to go into the promised land. Remember, the first generation had to wander in the wilderness and die off. And now that second generation is getting ready to go in and take the promises their parents were supposed to have. They're going to go in and possess this good land that has cities they did not build, wells they did not dig, houses and fruit trees and gardens and springs of water that they're just going to go in and inherit. And Moses is giving them wisdom. He's, he's telling them before he dies, he's telling them all the instructions again. And he says, and now Israel, 
What does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you think, well, wait a minute. We just read all these verses about fear, and God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Now it says for us to fear the Lord. How can those be together? How can those two seemingly opposite things be together? Well, because you'll read a lot in the Bible, even in the New Testament, about the fear of the Lord. In fact, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, and remember one of the criminals to his side hanging on a cross also made fun of him and mocked him and said, if you're really God, why don't you save us? And the other criminal says, don't you fear God? Don't you know this man's done nothing wrong? We deserve what we are, we're getting, but he doesn't deserve this. So you read about the fear of God in the Bible and you think, how does, how does that relate? How, how can I put peace and the fear of God together? Well, let's think about it. I grew up thinking the fear of God was that he was going to punish me if I messed up. I was always afraid of this, you know, guy in a white beard sitting on this big white throne and he had a fly swatter and he was waiting to whack me when I messed up. And I thought that was the fear of the Lord. So one of the reasons that you don't want to mess up is because you don't want to get whacked. And I thought that's what the fear of the Lord was. And it's true, God is a God of justice, and he's a God of judgment, he, of judging sin. But remember, Jesus took the payment for sin for us. So we don't have to receive that judgment of sin. We just have to believe in that payment and receive that payment for our sin. God's not wanting to whack us. God wants to love us. He wants to bring us in as his children. But if you're fearing God because you think he's going to punish you or that he's unhappy with you or that somehow you have to work to please him, you have the wrong idea of what the fear of the Lord is. And you're not going to have peace about God. And how do you receive from someone that you can't trust? So the enemy has really contorted our perception of the fear of the Lord. What if... The fear of the Lord is something else. Let's look at some more verses. Let's read Psalms 34, 4, and I'm going to read it out of the Passion. Listen to my testimony. I cried to God in my distress, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Okay, all my fears? So do I not have the fear of the Lord anymore? Let's look at Psalm 34, 7 through 9. The angel of the Lord stooped down to listen as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, and showing me how to escape. He will do this for everyone who fears God. Drink deeply of the pleasures of this God. Experience for yourself the joyous mercies he gives to all who turn to hide themselves in him. To all who turn to hide themselves in him. So I'm not running away from him. I'm running to him. Worship in awe and wonder all you who've been made holy. For all who fear him will feast with plenty. That doesn't sound like fear of God's a bad thing, does it? That sounds like I'm supposed to go to him, not away from him. I'm not supposed to hide in my shame and my fear. I'm supposed to go to him and hide myself in him. Psalm 25, 12 through 14 says, who are they that live in the holy fear of God? You, meaning God, will show them the right path to take. Then prosperity and favor will be their portion, and their descendants will inherit all that is good. Okay, now listen to this. There's a private place reserved for the lovers of God, where they sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. See, the enemy has really distorted our view of who God is. Is God love? Yes, that's his character. It's not that God just loves us. He is love. Yes. It's not that God can give us peace. He is peace. Yes. It's not that God just can just heal us. He is the healer. 
It's not that God is just merciful. He is mercy. Do you see there's a big difference? I heard Chris Valentin one time, and I can't remember exactly what he was explaining, but I thought it was very funny, and I remembered it. He said, there's a big difference in me saying, my girl is a dog, or my dog is a girl. Big difference, isn't there? So when we say the fear of the Lord, and we're trying to explain who God is, the fear of the Lord is that he's all these things I cannot be. I cannot be love. I cannot be peace. I cannot be mercy. I cannot be salvation. I can't be any of those things. But he is. And when I run to him and I become one of his lovers and we have an intimate relationship, then I take on his character. Because isn't that how God designed the marriage relationship? The two become one. That's how he designed our relationship. We become one with him. And his peace becomes our peace. His love becomes our love. His mercy becomes our mercy. And so if we want peace, real peace, not as the world gives, but as only God can give, then we have to have that nearness where he whispers his secrets to us. Where he, it's not, the devil yells at us. He, he, the voices of the world yell at us. We have all these voices, they yell at us. But the voice of the Holy Spirit is always quiet because he wants you to come near to hear it. He wants you to be right here and let me whisper my secrets to you and tell you because this is about relationship. So if we want peace with God, then we've got to, the fear of the Lord is we've got to be afraid to be far from him. We've got to be afraid to be who we are. I know what I'm capable of. I know who I am in my flesh. And there are times I fail and I become that person again. And it terrifies me. And I think that's not who I am. I used to be that, but I'm not that anymore. And Jesus says, just come back over here and let me remind you who you are. Come over here and let me whisper in your ear about how wonderful you really are. And how much I love you. And what the price was that I paid for you so you don't have to be you anymore. Come be the you I've created The one I knew before you were even born. And that's where we get our true peace. The fear of the Lord. I'm afraid to be without him. I'm afraid that if I'm not near him, I'll go back to being what I was. But when I'm near him, he imparts his character to me, his grace, his love. And it changes me from the inside out. And then it can start coming out. That's what true peace is. When we quit relying on ourselves to try and make our circumstances and everything perfect, because you're looking at someone who thought she could make life perfect. I've always been a perfectionist. I've always been a pleaser, and I like things done just so-so. And I can't do it. And there's a lot of frustration in that. But I know the perfect one. And the perfect one lives inside of me And he whispers and tells me how to live this life so that I don't have to try and get my value out of being perfect anymore. Because I realized that my value was never in that. I was trying to be something I couldn't be. Have you ever tried to love someone you couldn't love? But God can give you a love because he loves all people. And when we start living like that, then we're going to start loving what God loves. And God loves people, all people, all colors, all shapes, all sizes, all flavors, people who are not lovable. God loves them. And we can start loving. And we're going to start hating the things he hates. He hates sin because it's going to destroy us. And he knows it will destroy us. And he can give us. the the thoughts that he has to reject it and resist it and live in peace. And we all want peace. All the world is crying for peace.